Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't know whether uh, Charlie Kramer feels happy or not being the last one up on the on this this weekend. Whether he feels now that he's going to be compared, uh, I, I think that that uh, he will. If if that is the case, then I think he will shine as brightly as anybody else. Uh, I've had the pleasure of spending a few days with with Charlie photographing in uh, in the Sierras um, 18 months or so ago now and uh, uh, I've admired his photographs for many many years very beautiful um, very peaceful images um, he's a quiet man he's a modest man he's a fantastic photographer he's a wonderful person for understanding light and composition and and I think he is Go going <laughs> <laughs> he's um He's eager for compliments, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think he will really, really uh, impress you with the quality of his work this afternoon. So without further ado, Charlie, or Charles Kramer. Thank you. Well, uh, you actually won't be seeing that much of my work in my talk, but will I, what I will be talking about is uh, some of my interactions with uh, Ansel Adams, and also another wonderful photographer, Don Worth, and some trips to Australia. Some thoughts about art and perception that I like to share. Uh, one of my little pet peeves, the importance of highlights. And, uh, and then finally, to end with uh, a little talk about some photography with music. And then we'll get to see some of my images. Um, a little bit about my background, uh, I, uh, since I went to university to make the big money, I of course studied classical piano uh, and then did graduate work here at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. Uh, but just weeks before leaving for my first year at Eastman, I went to this magical place, Yosemite. I, I live about four hours away, but I had never been there. And it was quite a revelation, and it, uh, it changed my life. And there's very interesting interactions uh, between music and photography. Uh, for example, uh, this is the founder of the Eastman School of Music, uh, George Eastman. You might have heard of him. He also founded uh, Eastman Kodak Company. Uh, but he, he loved music, and so he donated the money for the school. And uh, in music school, we spend five or six hours as a pianist uh, in little practice rooms without windows. And, uh, you know, all this time I'm thinking about the wilds of Yosemite and what I'm missing out on. So I had to go to the library and get various books uh, on Yosemite. And it was there that I first read about uh, Ansel Adams. And uh, another interaction with photography and music, Ansel started off as a pianist. And as you can see, a very serious pianist. Uh, he was a master printmaker, and he said this, the negative is like the composer's score, the print, the performance. And as a pianist, uh, you know, all we do is perform things that have already been written, so I immediately uh, fell in love with printing, and I understood Ansel's reverence for the fine print. And all that year, uh, you know, I would kind of drool over Ansel's wonderful Yosemite images. Now, I actually had some background in photography. My dad had a darkroom, and, uh, but what I did was, uh, with my 35 millimeter, take happy snaps of my friends in high school. Um, so I didn't realize that photography could also be an art form. But when I got back that first summer, uh, I realized I needed a bigger camera. So I bought this old press camera. Uh, it takes four by five, or five by four, and it folds up like a little lunchbox, so, so it's very handy. And uh, so off I went into Yosemite. Uh, no tripod needed, right? Because it's, it's got that uh, nice little handle there. Uh, I had uh, a little meter in my pocket and some film holders in the back pocket, and uh, these are my Yosemite photos. As you can see, I'm breaking new ground in composition. And uh, even at this early stage, I realized that a 
foreground element can give depth to a picture. Um, this is uh, Yosemite Falls. Uh, this is the falls. That's a light leak. Um, and after seeing my work here, you're probably wondering why am I giving this lecture? Well, it's something that uh, musicians have known, you know, forever. And that is, if you want to get better, you just practice. And I loved being out in the wilds uh, or in, you know, national parks, and I loved doing photography. So I got better. And I really believe in uh, this uh, book, uh, the theory here uh, that Malcolm Gladwell put forth, where he basically says, uh, talent plays an insignificant part in success. It's all about putting in your time. And uh, that was good for me because I did not seem to have any discernible talent in photography, either technically or aesthetically. Um, so I figure if I can do it, uh, anybody can. And I'm often very surprised that this is what I do now. <laughs> so, but back to the uh, 70s, uh, Ansel became like a god to me, really. Uh, here he is descending from on high with the tablets containing the 10 zones of the zone system. This is a photo by Kay Murray, who showed up to Ansel's house one day with these props and asked Ansel to pose, and Ansel loved a good joke, so uh, he said, sure. So in uh, 1977, I was still a pianist, and uh, uh, a local group asked me to do a piano recital, and here's the flyer. And so at this recital, I was also going to show some of my uh, photographs. And uh, later in uh, 77, in June, I had signed up to attend the Ansel Adams uh, Yosemite Workshop. So when I was mailing this out to friends, I thought, well, I should send one to Ansel. And, uh, you know, when you get an invitation in the mail like this, you, I mean, is it expected to, to, for people to respond? I, I know I wouldn't, but I got this in the mail. And I think this kind of summarizes Ansel. He's very generous, you know, because he was a busy man, um, and he was very encouraging. And uh, so, you know, he, he would do very nice things like that. And here's that workshop. Uh, this is me in the foreground. And uh, it was uh, quite a treat. Uh, at the workshop, I also met uh, this man on the left, Ron Bentley, an Australian photographer who wanted to start a scholarship program to bring uh, photographers to Australia on an all-expenses-paid trip. And somehow, I ended up being selected. And uh, uh, I went and uh, had a fantastic time, um, and so much so that uh, Ron did it again the next year, uh, but this time invited this man, uh, Don Worth. Uh, Don was an assistant to Ansel Adams in the late 50s and uh, was a, a conversant both in color and in black and white. He's uh, mainly uh, famous for his plant photographs. And uh, in the you know, late 50s, uh, Ansel Adams could not really make a living selling prints. In fact, uh, no way. Uh, so he, had, he did a lot of commercial work. And this is an example of some commercial work. This is done for the Colorama. It was a 60-foot long transparency that Kodak uh, showed in Grand Central Station in New York City. And uh, uh, as an assistant, Don's job was to sometimes pose in these pictures. And uh, there he is. And I'm sure uh, Ansel told him before they left, this, is, this will be a color photograph, so you must wear a red shirt. Now, perhaps you will not believe this next little thing, but Don started off as a pianist also. Uh, he got a master's in piano from Juilliard. And uh, he had a nine-foot Steinway here. And so over the years, I got to give uh, several recitals uh, at his house. So uh, here's Don in uh, Australia. This is uh, Ayers Rock or Uluru. Uh, he brought his 8x10 Deerdorf here. 
And if Ron, you know, wanted to take lessons from Don Worth, uh, uh, this was the way to do it because uh, you, we were there for a month, and so it was like a month-long lesson from an incredible photographer and someone who was intimately familiar with Ansel Adams. And uh, again, we had so much fun that we came back the next year. Uh, here's Don with his 4 by 5 And uh, we'd often be arrayed, uh, this is in Adelaide, we're doing some architectural photography, but here's uh, Ron with his Hasselblad, Don with his 8x10, and my 4x5. And uh, I remember we were set up in a similar configuration in the wilds of Tasmania. And a local farmer wandered by and said, uh, what's up? And uh, Ron replied, uh, we're surveying for the new freeway. <laughs> we also flew to a little island south of uh, South Australia called Kangaroo Island. Uh, here's uh, Don and I in the uh, Kangaroo Island Airport Lounge. Uh, the plane was so small, I sat next to the pilot, and he had to buzz the dirt runway first to get all the sheep off before landing. Kangaroo Island has this incredible formation called Remarkable Rocks, and indeed they are. And it's like a granite dome right on the ocean with modern sculptures set on it. Uh, and also notice I'm carrying around this viewing card and uh, Ansel handed those out at his workshop and was a big believer in them. And I became, a, and still am a big believer in them, so I ha must have my viewing card to compose. Uh, uh, that's my jumbo one. Uh, I now have a smaller one. Um, uh, and the, uh, my new uh, viewing card actually is mirrorless, so it's, uh, it's very light to uh, carry. <laughs> here's Don set up at uh, Remarkable Rocks, uh, and uh, here's a photograph he made there. And uh, here's a photograph I made, and I also made this one. And uh, I did get to show Ansel Prince on uh, multiple occasions, and uh, when I showed him this one, he pointed right here and smiled. And um, I think that's because the foreground and background rock almost intersect there. It's a point of great tension. And also, the horizon line, the ocean, goes right through that little opening. So I think Ansel liked that. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, pretty sure I did that on purpose. <laughs> Ansel loved photography, and uh, his typical schedule was get up and do correspondence, you know, like send Charlie a postcard. And, uh, and then he'd go in the dark room for a whole day uh, work. Uh, but he loved to quit at 5 o'clock for cocktails. And uh, he would usually invite, uh, you know, young photographers to come over. So it was not uncommon to, at 5 o'clock for Ansel to see even more photographs and be more generous and encouraging with photographers. Um, and in the little nook where Ansel had the liquor, uh, he had this clock here, so it was like always five o'clock. <laughs> Here's Don set up in Tasmania uh, for a sunset picture. And uh, this is the resulting image. Uh, this does not do justice to it. Uh, Don loved to do what he called pale prints, where there are no black tones in the print, so it's very ethereal. And Don actually considered this one of his very best pictures ever. In traveling around Australia, we ran into this ranch, and this man had two more A's than Ansel did. So uh, uh, Ron and I had to take a picture to send to Ansel. Now, this was before email or Facebook, so we actually had to make a print, very carefully, I may add, uh, and mailed it to Ansel. And Ansel, of course, uh, wrote a very nice letter back. And uh, Ansel all also wrote to Ron, and Ron kindly sent me a copy of this postcard, which I treasure now because uh, uh, he seemed to like my photos. 
And around this time, I had uh, I was doing another piano recital and uh, had recorded it and made some cassette tapes. So I decided to send Ansel the cassette tape, and uh, never expecting you know to hear anything from him. That's that would be normal operating procedure. So I was very shocked when I got this in the mail, and he actually listened to it and uh, seemed to like it. So that's very gratifying. Uh, Ansel's favorite pianist, though, was this uh, man, uh, the Russian uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi, one of the greats. And uh, for Ansel's 80th birthday party, uh, they, the staff were going to surprise Ansel by inviting Ashkenazi to give a private recital at Ansel's home. And uh, Ashkenazi said he'd actually never done this before, but it turns out he was an Ansel Adams fan, so uh, he accepted, uh, and I guess everything went beautifully. Uh, here's uh, Ashkenazi at Ansel's place. This is Ansel's piano that he bought in, uh, what, 1925, I think, when he was still planning on being a pianist. This eventually became a record cover. Um, and they had such a great time that they did it again uh, two years later for Ansel's 82nd birthday. This would be 1984. And seating at these events is very limited. And uh, so I was again floored when I got this in the mail. And I later heard uh, from Ansel's staff that they were a little upset with Ansel for inviting me because there were many more uh, more important people that they wanted to invite. And, uh, but Ansel thought, uh, I'm guessing here, that uh, Charlie is a pianist, so she, he should hear the pianist. And so here's the program that Ashkenazi played that day. Uh, it was an incredible experience. When we showed up, however, um, Ansel was not there. Uh, he had, had been having heart problems, and so a day or two earlier he had actually had checked himself into the hospital, but uh, they assured us that uh, you know he was feeling better and he wanted the party to go on and Ashkenazi agreed, so uh, the, the recital went on and uh, uh, you know, hearing a great pianist at the home of a great photographer, it uh, doesn't get any better than that. So it was an incredible experience for me. And uh, so uh, what happened the next morning was more than slightly distressing. And I think this was just like Ansel. He didn't want to spoil the party, so he held on until, uh, you know, after everything was done. And here is Ansel posing in front of this image uh, called the monolith face of Half Dome. Uh, made in 1927 by Ansel. This was a mural print that he had uh, in his uh, uh, living room and uh, no glazing at all on it. It's, it's stunning print. And uh, Ansel never said what his favorite image of his own was, but many people consider it to be this one. And, uh, and it was very important to Ansel uh, also uh, Ansel uh, and some friends and his then fiance Virginia went up to the diving board, a very grueling hike up to this uh, middle point where you can see the 2,000 foot tall face of Half Dome. And uh, he, he was using that day the latest in photographic technology, uh, which was panchromatic film, uh, film sensitive to all colors of light. And at the time, it was only available in glass plates. So he brought along a camera that would take glass plates, and he brought 12 of them. And uh, uh, he had taken a bunch and, and actually got some very good images. And uh, they waited around for the light to get good on Half Dome. This was exposure number 11. And I have simulated that exposure here uh, by messing with it, because this first image, Ansel used a uh, yellow filter, uh, to, which normally darkens the sky just a little. But as soon as he took it, he said, he realized that this was not going to express what he was feeling at the time. 
And so with his last uh, uh, plate of film, he then put on the red filter, and that's what, what resulted. And he considers this his first visualization. In other words, thinking of what the print's going to look like uh, before he exposes the film and you know, taking steps to realize that uh, visualization. So Ansel writes, quote, I can still recall the excitement of seeing the visualization come true when I removed the plate from the fixing bath for examination. The desired values were all there in their beautiful negative interpretation. This was one of the most exciting moments of my photographic career. The BBC Three Radio uh, recently, in the last couple months, did a program on Ansel Adams and music and interviewed various people, including myself, uh, but mainly uh, Ash Kanazi, who came back, and here he is back at Ansel's house uh, for this interview. Um, and uh, there's a lot of excerpts of Ansel talking about himself and his music and photography. And for a radio program about photography, I think it's uh, one of the best things out there. So, uh, this is now, let's go back, to, uh, it's like 1975 now, and I'm doing black and white prints and uh, it, taking a special care with the printing process. And somebody set up a meeting with the local curator at a museum, and so I sh showed her some of these prints. She looked through about three of them, but then looked up at me and said something I had never heard before, you know, after many years in music. Uh, she said... Really? Because <laughs> as a pianist, of course, we play all the great pieces that everybody has played millions of times before. So this was very strange to hear. Um, and uh, I think the visual art world uh, especially has a preoccupation with always doing something new. And they call it uh, the tyranny of the new. And. I know people who went to college uh, studying photography, hoping to continue with the photographs that they liked, but the peer pressure was so intense that if they did like landscapes, uh, they would be laughed out of class. Um, uh, I remember speaking to Don Worth about this, and um, it, this was in the early 80s, and uh, Don said that uh, you know he had taught photography at San Francisco State for 30 years and had seen many photographs. Uh, but he told me, he said, the only thing that hasn't been, been done before is black and white underwater photography. And I hadn't seen it. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid uh, I have news. Uh, there is now nothing left to do in photography. <laughs> because the Center for Photographic Art uh, four years ago had a show of five underwater black and white photographers. And, and I must say, it was a wonderful show. And there were some incredible images. So, since everything's been done before, what are we left with? Well, there's a quote by this painter, Ran Ortner, that I love. And he says, art is not a skill contest, nor an innovation contest. Art is an honesty contest. If we can be precisely who we are in the most intimate and candid and courageous way, we will start to connect to the universal. Our job as artists is to become powerfully personal in our work. And I think this goes along with what uh, Joseph Campbell the mythologist said, you know, follow your bliss. And so I think this is the way to eventually develop your own style, which will differentiate you from other photographers, and then you'll be doing something different. So, you know, don't try to imitate others, just do what you like and, uh, and, and see what happens. So, uh, end of sermon, that's, uh, that's uh, what I follow. So, uh, what I'd like to show now is um, uh, some ideas about perception that I have 
that hopefully might be useful. Uh, some of these are found in this book, uh, uh, Vision and Art, The Biology of Seeing, by Margaret Livingstone, a fascinating book. And uh, so, uh, way back when I first showed Ansel some photographs, uh, he looked at one of them. It wasn't this one, but this is a, has the same problem. But uh, Ansel grabbed the photograph and brought it up next to him, and he said, all it needs is a thumb, because uh, he thought there was a little objectionable thing right there, so he put his thumb there. And uh, by the way, that's not Ansel's thumb, uh, and no thumbs were hurt in making this photo. But what Ansel wanted to see is this, and what I showed him was that. You know, how picky. Uh, it's just a little thing compared, you know, it's like a half a percent of the picture. But the problem is it's right on the edge of the picture. And what I learned from Ansel and others is that the edges are very important. And for the cleanest, most, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, impressive photo, the edges should be somewhat clean of little objectionable things right on the edge. So I think it is better to get rid of that. And uh, this book actually might explain why this is the case. Uh, this is a cross-section of a retinal cell, and uh, it's composed uh, uh, using this very strange system called the center surround system. And if light were to illuminate just the middle here, the pluses, your brain would send a very excited signal to you to, to, to look. Um, but if light hits the whole area, this outer area sends an inhibiting signal. You see the minuses here. So if light hits the whole thing, you, you don't pay any attention to it. If light, though, if you look at an edge, there are more pluses than minuses. And a corner even gives you more pluses than minuses. With this, your brain is kind of telling you, you know, you should look over here. It's kind of like... Uh, the peripheral vision when something moves, you know, it's amazing. It could be way outside your regular vision, but you notice it because we're hardwired to, to look for movement, uh, you know, which helped us uh, survive uh, for a long time. Um, so why would this be the case? Why would we be hardwired this way? Some say it's so that the system is more informationally efficient in other words, we're not having to pay attention to everything that we see you know, all, at all times. This system is narrowing down what's of interest by finding areas of contrast or detail. And I think that might explain why those little things assume uh, extra importance because they're on the edge of the picture. And understanding the center surround system may help explain why we have problems when we view this. And uh, I think uh, you must be thinking these are two solid patches. Wrong. Uh, if I put a reference tone under there, you now suddenly see these are actually little gradients. These are the same gradients, even though they don't look the same. We, our brain enjoys this. But when I take that reference away, the problem is these tones change so gradually that we're just we're wired not to pay attention to those very gradual changes. And I'm thinking this might help explain why uh, in the analog and the digital darkroom, for example, if I'm going to select this bottom area with my favorite selection tool, the lasso tool, uh, I initially do a hard edge selection. And if I do the tiniest little change here, it will be instantly obvious. But to disguise it, all I have to do is feather it a little. And it's amazing what we can get away with, you know, the changes we can make to that bottom part. And it's all because it, it, it changes more gradually. And I think our brain helps us, you know, hide it. Here's uh, one of Ansel's famous pictures. Um, I, however, have modified it uh, because John Sexton says uh, in the original negative and obviously in the original scene that the sky was brighter 
than uh, Mount McKinley, or Denali as they call it now. And so this is what Ansel was confronted with. And so uh, two things. Uh, I think to make the mountain glow, he's going to want to darken that sky. Uh, let's see how much he's going to darken it. That's a lot of darkening. And Ansel had to do this in the dark room, waving cards around. And Ansel was the master of that. And John says this is one of the most difficult of his to print for that reason. But in the dark room, let's just go back. Wow. So Ansel was not afraid to do departures from reality because this made the mountain really glow now. Um, but if Ansel can do that in the uh, analog darkroom, you know, uh, I think we can do it in the digital darkroom. And I know that uh, the way I work, I mainly do feathered selections and 90% uh, of the time, and it's rare, fortunately, that I have to do an accurate or hard edge selection because those take so much time and can cause artifacts. So uh, I want to talk about another aspect of perception. Here's a, uh, uh, a rectangle, and, and I would like to measure the brightness of this rectangle uh, first on the right side. And in Photoshop, I'm going to use the uh, info palette and see what it says. Now, both in Photoshop and in Lightroom, you can now choose to view the readout in LAB color mode. And it takes a little getting used to, but it's so much simpler. Uh, L stands for luminosity, so that first number is how bright or dark the tones are. Zero is pure black, 100 is pure white, so it's like a percentage. And this is like a little bit above middle gray. Very easy to figure out. Um, but let's do the other side. And uh, I'm thinking maybe 48, 45. Uh, really, 54. So uh, I'm experiencing cognitive dissonance here because my eyes are telling me one thing, but Photoshop is telling me another. So who do I believe? Who would you believe? Photoshop, I think so. Because let me take away the background here. And suddenly now it's obvious that is a solid rectangle. It's the background that has the gradient. And this side looks lighter because it's against these darker tones. This looks darker because it's against lighter tones. So it's all about the context of your tones. And knowing this can really uh, improve your processing and printing uh, skill. And for example, in a, a photo of mine, I have these uh, tree trunks in the middle and I really wanted them to glow. And they were already plenty bright. So I thought, well, then I'll do the next best thing. I will darken the surrounding tones. And I think that makes those brighter tones glow more. Let me go back. So if you want to lighten a picture, darken the surrounding tones, or vice versa. Uh, uh, I mainly teach uh, digital printing classes because, as I said, uh, I've always loved printing because that's uh, uh, kind of, you know, what I did as a pianist. Um, so uh, I've always had a special place for that in my heart. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, things to do so that your prints will come out closer to what you think they look like on the monitor because uh, are monitors deceptive? Well, they must be. I've asked you this question. Uh, can you trust your eyes? I think you've learned you can't. So a monitor is a special kind of thing. It's its own reality. You could say it's a reality distortion field. It has no context with the real world. And the longer you look at it, the better things look because your brain starts adapting to it. And if you bring up an image to, you know, think about making a print, uh, in my experience, it'll look good on the monitor. Most images do. But if you go to make a print, it's often surprising how bad the print looks 
Um, but if you adjust it so it makes a good print, it still looks good on the monitor. So it's like the monitor is a very uncritical way of assessing your image. I liken it to uh, like uh, color or black and white negative film. Uh, it has a wide latitude. It's very forgiving, uh, some think. And uh, compare that with color transparencies or slides. Uh, you almost have to have the exposure right on the money. So to me, the negatives are like the monitor, very forgiving. And the transparencies are like your print. So if you can get uh, your print looking good, then your image is probably as good as it's going to get. And even uh, if I'm going to post a picture online, I will often print it just to be sure, because I still don't completely trust the monitor or my, and or my eyes. Once you make a print, though, that print goes into the real world. You know, with you view it with reflected light, so you know very well how how it looks versus the glowing monitor, which can cast a spell, I think. And something that uh, Joe just touched upon in his uh, lightning talk is things to do to uh, uh, make sure the print looks as it should. Uh, in Photoshop, we have different screen modes. The first one uh, can show you the, your desktop. This one is the light gray. We've got the black. And of the three, I, I prefer the light gray but I was printing a picture like this a long time ago, and I wanted the fog to be very nice and bright. And, uh, and the fog here looks nice and bright. And, uh, but I'd make a print, and uh, it would look dingy in the print. And uh, I, I realized, you know, when I mount my prints, I mount them on whiteboard, so why don't I use a white surround? And so if I switch to white, now you can see that uh, the fog really isn't that bright. And so now I'm going to brighten the fog. And now that makes a print like I wanted it to. I also like to have lots of the canvas showing because I want to see how my eye travels in the picture. And um, for example, when I view it with the grace around, you notice this corner feels a little light. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, when I make the print, I might have to darken that so my eye doesn't travel out of the picture. But when I view it with the whites around, I think the corner looks fine. So uh, no problem there. And uh, this is Photoshop, but in uh, Lightroom, you can also do the same thing. You don't get as much canvas, but you can go up to this little thing right here and choose a smaller size to view or just uh, hit the L key twice on your keyboard and you'll get the lights out mode. And in the Lightroom preferences, uh, lights out mode, sc screen color, white. And for the main window, white, white. And uh, uh, what Joe said, I think, is right in the money. The, the complaint people have is their prints normally come up too dark and so this will lighten them. And I also think it's important uh, if you map your photos on a whiteboard uh, after I've made a proof print to really see it exactly how it's going to be seen, I, I tape it uh, into the, one of these reusable mats that I have. And then one of the greatest inventions in photography is this little shelf. And so I can prop up uh, these little proof prints and uh, leave them there and many times I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, Joe was rudely interrupted there at the end and was about to talk about the importance of time in evaluating your images. And having them on a shelf like this is very handy. And uh, John Sexton talks about uh, often leaving problem prints on his shelf. And, you know, over a course of a week or months, or actually in one case a year, he'd, you know, go by the picture in his daily travels and uh, he said this one problem image that one morning he was in the shower and then it came to him what he needed to do. So uh, it can take time to figure out you know, exactly what you want to do with your print. So as I said, the common complaint people have is my prints are too dark. On any photographic form, you'll, you'll see that this is the case. And so um, uh, 
the surround can play a big difference here. Here is uh, black. Now it's darker with a white surround. And it's black again. Uh, and for example, how, what kind of print will this make? Can you even tell? I don't think so, because there's no reference to reality here. There are objective tools in Photoshop you can use, the histogram and the info palette, and here's my LAB readout. And turns out the brightest tone in this area here, this picture, is uh, middle gray, basically. Another diagnostic tool is to select a little area, and the selected area shows in the histogram. If I move this down, you'll see the histogram change. So that's helpful sometimes. And I've made a test print here with a picture of a sand dune, and I've adjusted it to give out various L values here. And in my experience, anything L6 and below basically prints as black. So uh, uh, when you're assessing your image, you want to uh, make sure that your important shadow deal detail is greater than 6. So I've mentioned about the negative is like the score um, and the mindset you use in evaluating uh, a negative versus a, uh, a piece of music is very, very similar. Now Ansel uh, did both and I'm wondering what he thought about the expressive potentials of both mediums. Perhaps music is the most expressive of the arts. However, as a photographer, I believe that creative photography, when practiced in terms of its inherent qualities, may also reveal endless horizons of meaning. That's, that's how Ansel talked. <laughs> uh, but he thought photography was just as expressive as uh, music. And I think printing your own work is especially important. Here's a negative of an apple. Uh, and if I took this to the chemist uh, or the drugstore to, to have a print made, uh, it might come out looking like this. But this is a negative by Paul Capernegro, the elder, and uh, one of my favorite black and white photographers. And when he prints it, he prints it like this. And now it's not just about an apple. It's about stars and galaxies. It's more than an apple. And this can obviously be done in uh, color photography. Here's one of my uh, images. This is the film scan. And in the film scan, the, the original conditions uh, were kind of backwards for how I like things. In other words, the brightest part of the picture is right up here. And people look at those bright areas. And so what I'm going to do, I want to reorchestrate the light to... to indicate where I want people to look. And these aspen trees really need some help. So here we go. Uh, let me go backwards and do it again. And uh, fortunately, people are attracted to bright, shiny objects, as we in America have just learned. Um, <laughs> I've shown you this picture, and um, my eye is kind of traveling all the way across it here like this, and so I think I need to darken the edges, and I've already kind of showed you that, actually. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about in this picture, I've zoomed in here, and there's little sky holes up here. And these are what I call rogue highlights. They're out of control. They are not enhancing your composition. And when I look at this, I kind of feel like I've had too much caffeine. You know, my eye is bouncing around to all these bright areas. Sometimes it's hard to see those bright areas. So as Joe indicated also, inverting the picture is very helpful. It discombobulates your brain and suddenly you just look at the bright things. But let me get rid of those things. I uh, thought they were so important to remove that when I used to make a dye transfer print of this image, I would get the retouching brushes and, and you know, paint out each and every one on each and every print. But with digital now, it's easy. And may I say, ah, uh, because it just works so much better. Let me go back. Ah. <laughs> and now I can enjoy 
the beautiful tones in the trunk without being distracted. Uh, here's another highlight uh, image that actually these highlights uh, are not rogue. They actually need encouragement. Uh, this is uh, in Yosemite. The sun had risen over the canyon rim uh, uh, a little earlier and backlit these trees that were quite wet and they started steaming. So we have backlit steam, backlit branches. Uh, and then of course we have the snow and sun. So this film scan is very objective. And you know, the, the, the steaming backlit steam, that's like a little bit above middle gray. Um, and I could have sworn it was really, really bright, but uh, that's my subjective opinion. So when I print this, I have to brighten up the steam. And now that feels more like I wanted it to do. The question might be, how do you select steam? And, uh, and the, all these tiny little backlit branches, that sounds like a big uh, job. But let me show you how I would do it. So I would select this area here, and I'm staying away from the really bright snow. And the, in this selected area, the brightest thing is the branches or the steam. So all I have to do then is in the curve, lock down points. This top lockdown point is the brightest tree without steam on it. And then everything else here is the steam. So I, I yank the curve pretty steeply here. And what this does again, here's before, after. And I wrote up this technique on the luminous landscape about uh, 12 years ago. I mean, sorry, four years ago, uh, and I call these tonal selections. And I use them, this technique all the time. This is one reason why I always want to use Photoshop, uh, because Lightroom doesn't allow curves for local selections. One other thing about highlights, uh, when I was doing dye transfer, we, we had to make highlight masks for every picture, and uh, because we had to correct for this very poor film, and uh, as long as I'm making highlight masks, I was thinking, you know, this little foreground tree, what if it's, it's almost trying to glisten, but it doesn't quite make it, and I thought, what if I help it along? So I uh, made a highlight mask, and I bleached everything else out, and then put this in the enlarger to make the printing plates, and so this is before, and that's after. And it's, a, it's not a huge change, but I think that extra little kiss of light, you know, really helps bring that picture to light, to uh, life. So I think adding light, this is something I do continually to open up uh, areas. So to conclude, I'd like to uh, show some music and photographs by two of my big influences, uh, uh, Don Worth and Ansel Adams. And um, for Ansel, uh, he recorded some 78 RPM records in 1945. And uh, uh, this is Michael Adams, Ansel's son. Uh, and uh, Ansel, uh, sorry, uh, Michael and his wife Jeannie uh, now live in Ansel's uh, Carmel Highlands home. And you can see some of Ansel's uh, pho original photographs here. I think they picked up this poster at the Tesco store. Um, either that or it's incredibly valuable. Um, but uh, uh, Michael knew that I had had some experience in digital audio, so he asked me to help digitize these. Uh, John Sexton came over too. So we're trying to figure out uh, how many different recordings there were because there's like a set of several of these albums. Um, and I think we finally got it. Here's a close-up of one of these records. So we'll be listening to this Chopin uh, prelude in A major, um, uh, and we'll be viewing some pictures of Ansel made by various people, including several I made at the uh, Ansel Adams workshop. And uh, these recordings have not been publicly released, but I have Michael's uh, permission to play that here today. Uh, for Don Worth, uh, in 1957, uh, they did a documentary uh, on Ansel, 
and uh, this was when Don was working for Ansel and they needed a soundtrack, so uh, Don was also a composer, so Ansel asked Don to write the music for the film. So uh, we'll be hearing Band 8, and uh, we'll be seeing some of Don Worth's uh, spectacular uh, still lifes. Uh, uh, the, uh, these are some uh, pictures of flowers against incredible fabrics. Also, one of his hero shrines, as he called them, where in this case it'll be a, a, an old Chinese master, and he, he assembles things to kind of pay tribute to it. And uh, so, uh, to end, here are two uh, remembrances of both these uh, photographers with their art and music. And then to really put you to sleep, uh, I'll end with some of my photos and myself playing a slow Scarlatti Sonata. So first up is Don Worth. Thanks to Tim, Charlotte, and Joe, uh, and on Landscape, and thanks to you for listening. Welcome back to our last session for this conference in the Green Room, and I have with me Charlie Kramer. Um, I've just uh, had, uh, I think, uh, one of the nicest experiences that I can remember watching a, a lecture. Uh, not only were your images fabulous but but uh, I love the humor and uh, and I love the insight for 
you know, you are a, you are um, you probably don't like to be called this, but a missing link between <laughs> <laughs> between modern photographic practice and and uh, and the and the age of the sacred Ansel. Um, how does how does that feel? <laughs> Weird. I, I don't feel old. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all feel nineteen or whatever, don't we? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was my uh, uh, form formative years, and so I think you know, uh, I really uh, think the final print is incredibly important. And and you know, it, when you used to make them in the dark room, they were much more work. And so when you got a good print, you know, you were really really proud of it and it's maybe not quite as much work now but uh, it's still just as hard to get a good print how, how long would it take typically to do something like a dye transfer print um, well if you gave me a transparency in the morning and I worked all day I might have it done that evening one one, one, one off yes yeah, yeah. because there's so many steps yeah and the steps give you the incredible control but also there's room for things to go terribly wrong Right, because there's no feedback until you make that first print. So, on, in in the digital darkroom, you, every every print can be churned out exactly the same. Die transfers, they were all slightly different. Well, the you made these printing plates, and it's kind of like silk screening. And these printing plates were dipped in. You had three of them dipped in trays of cyan, magenta, yellow dye, and uh, you pull them out of the dye and then roll them onto this white paper, and the dye would migrate into the paper. So you did that three times and eventually the colors it would start looking like a real uh, photograph and it's pretty repeatable actually once you've got everything it's right pin registered yes yeah yeah um you said something that i thought was uh you were describing um taking your photographs to see uh, a curator uh, and and you said uh, she looked through all of three and then and then said um it's been done before um and I thought it was very interesting that you said in music that's never something that, that ever bothers anybody. Uh, at least in uh, piano playing. For composers, they, they're under the same pressure, actually. And I knew a composer who went to Eastman right uh, at the same time I did, and he was very, very dissatisfied because he couldn't write what he wanted to write because they'd laugh at him. Right, okay. But because I, it was out of style. It, exactly, yes. But I think the pendulum has swung, and he actually later... Maybe 20 years later, he went back and got a master's in composition because there were, you know, I think musicians finally realized that the atonal stuff just was not uh, something people wanted to listen to or, you know, it was new for sure, but uh, eventually people started writing tonally again, and so that came back into style. And I'm thinking maybe the same thing uh, is happening in photography. But, you know, as landscape photographers, especially color landscape, and in the museum world, you know, we're, we don't exist, basically. No, no. Well, well yeah, I, I suppose starting with the new topographics, who were seen as doing something very different, Lewis Boltz et, et al., uh, um, Robert Adams, no relation of Ansel, um, that was seen as the, the next leap forward, wasn't it? Um, and, and since then, it's, it's I think, gained... Um, it's become more and more intellectual and more and more divorced from... I would say, from our perception of, of the world. Uh, Don Worth, who taught at San Francisco State for many years, said that uh, uh, many, many of the projects he, he got from people were conceptual projects. In other words, there was a story. And like one, I remember one person did a photograph of his mother every hour for like 48 hours. Right. And so you see the pictures and it's like, you know, there's nothing really very exciting about them unless no. you know the concept and then it becomes slightly interesting but you know not something you'd probably want to put on your wall no i think quite a lot of um modern art is uh, i suppose I, I would describe them as puns they're they're just a little kind of wrinkle and and in the hands of a master i think they can be fantastic i think you you might say that some of john blakemore's um work is a little bit like that hmm. he's, he's taken a, what you might say as a slight idea but because of the craftsmanship and the, and his artistic insight, he's produced something wonderful. The problem is that there seems to be a lack of, of both those things quite often, that the, the intellectual conceit becomes the thing. Would you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> you thought long and hard about that, Charlie. <laughs> um, I was going to say that... Uh, what was I going to say? Um, oh, that in music, you know, there's precedent for 
composers being terribly out of style and being scoffed at, actually, like Rachmaninoff. Yeah. And at, when he was alive, you know, people like uh, Schoenberg and Stravinsky were writing, and Rachmaninoff wrote very tame music. But, uh, you know, and the, at the time in the Groves Music Dictionary, they said, you know, he's a passing fancy, he'll, music will never last. And yet, uh, Palestrina was like that, too. So uh, I, my feeling is if you can do it, you know, with uh, integrity and conviction and craft, and uh, even if you are out of style, I, I very, very much liked your your um, your quote about it not being a a contest of uh, novelty or a contest of of, uh, of skill, skill, but a contest of honesty. And I and I think uh, that I think that's been a thread that has been running through the conference. I think a lot of people have said that you have to be honest to your own intentions. Um, and and I don't think that actually anybody produces any work that has any depth or resonance unless unless that is the case. Uh, I've long felt that the well, it seems to me that there's a sort of alchemy in photography because, in a way, all you're doing is you're representing the thing in front of the camera. But but if you do it with that integrity and that honesty, what you end up with is something that um, can surprise, something that gives insight, something that is perhaps lyrical, emotional. But you need to have that integrity and honesty for that to happen. When I look at your work. That's what I see, um, and uh, I think it shines out f- from your work. You know, you, you were talking about loop, you know, ch- fine adjustment of the of the image, working to increase luminosity and things. Like that. But to me, what shines out is is the honesty. Um, your Photoshop, the way you approach that with the with the luminosity and with the um, the adjustment of tones and color. Would you say that's a direct uh, kind of uh, um, in that Ansel Adams tradition? Well, um, Ansel certainly, and I think almost all analog photographs like John Sexton, I mean, maybe they don't feel that they're doing their job if they don't do a lot of that uh, dodging and burning. And Ansel once, uh, uh, in the darkroom, uh, when they were he was working with John, said something like... Uh, Dodging and burning uh, is to correct mistakes that God made in planning tonal relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, uh, and I was shocked to hear Mark Littlejohn, you know, say that he doesn't do that. Yeah. And uh, I. He might use a grad, but he doesn't do local adjustments. Yeah. And uh, I think it was interesting that he said he went out this morning to photograph, but the light was very flat. Yeah. And so he, he didn't take anything. Yeah, uh, and he wants a little kiss of sunlight to highlight something for him, and and then the picture starts to work. But I actually love very flat light yeah. because it's like a blank canvas, and you know the light is kind of even everywhere. And so what I can do then is darken it here, lighten it here, kind of like I did on the Aspen photo, you know, mm. where the light was up there, and I reorchestrated the light, and moved it. It's like a spotlight up there. Yeah. So then I move the spotlight down here, to, because th- this is what excited me when I made the picture, and and uh, you know I I wanted to recreate what it felt like when I made the picture, and uh, because you know my brain uh, is not objective when I'm out there, and uh, I'm uh, attending to uh, the things that I find enjoyable, and the film or sensor is very objective, and so in making the print, then I have to say, no, this is what was really important. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, yeah, I think we all probably have that um, that issue, is the gap between how the camera sees and, and the sensor or the film and how the human brain sees, because we we concentrate on, on elements that intrigue us or, or excite us. And we, we change the relationship in our heads. It's like the, uh, you've, I'm sure you've seen that, like when a bear comes out in Yellowstone and tourists get their pictures out and they take a picture and then they get the print back and it's this huge expanse with a tiny little bear yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yet when they made the photo they thought oh that such going to be a great photo yeah right? be, but they they were very subjective in there but, but you but there's a kind of a, um obverse of that when you were talking about the fact you know that ansel said all it needs is a thumb because the the tiniest detail can also be the most distracting can't it um I th- I th- I th- I th- I've um, long worried about the way that people talk about the way that light flows through a, through an image because lots of people 
I don't know if it's the same in the States, but in the UK, um, kind of when people are criticising photographs, they talk about how you read a photograph, and they assume that you read a photograph like a, uh, like a page, like mm. text. But you don't. You read light in a different way. You, you, you look at the dark first and the light last. Um, I think, actually, I think I look at the light first. Well, they've done tests. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Where they put little cameras on, yeah. a, on a pair of glasses and they watch how people's eyes hmm. move. And, the, and the, the explanation is evolution. The explanation is you look in the dark first because oh, that's where really? the threat might be. Interesting. And you're, it's a little like your diagram of um, the pluses and minuses about how the, the retinal cell works. Yeah. Because in that book that I referenced, uh, there is a Russian painting of a man standing in the forest. And then uh, years ago, they had people look at it for five minutes and traced where their eyes went. And the trace showed that people were very interested in the man. But then, well, they went up to the little piece of sky poking through the forest, right. which was the contrastiest area and the brightest area. I guess you could say it's also one of the darkest areas. So, right. so um, we, But if we see a figure... That kind of, I think that sort of trumps things. Yeah. Sorry to use that word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's, uh, we look for outlines of threats or other humans or... Right. Yeah. It's all, it all comes down to biology, really. And, and the, the compositional rules that we are, we are told, you know, the suggestions, perhaps, the guidelines, are really built upon that biological structure. So it's very interesting that you, you, you talked about that. That book sounded really fascinating. What was, what was the name of it again? Uh, Vision and Art. The Biology of Seeing by right. Margaret Livingstone. Okay, um, I, I must get myself a copy of that, especially if it's available on Kindle, because I've got too many things to take to Botswana already. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for joining me in the, in the green room. It's um, a pleasure. Uh, I've really enjoyed the, the day, and I think for me, your talk was the kind of the real highlight of the weekend. Hmm. Um, we're going to uh, sign off now. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, for the conference, vicariously. Uh, and uh, no doubt there will be another conference. Uh, I'm not sure how long Tim and Charlotte need to rest in a darkened room before they can <laughs> think about preparing that, but that we will be back. So thank you very much indeed, and it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from him.